Why, hello there, everyone. I am here to talk about Exoprimal, the Exoprimal beta test, which recently concluded, specifically the fourth beta test. Yes, you heard me right. This was the fourth beta test. I would not blame you for not knowing that this was the fourth one because barely anyone has been talking about this game. And if you watched my original Exoprimal impressions video based on the first beta test, which was only three hours long, you might be wondering why I waited until the fourth one to do a follow-up video. Well, that's because this time it was an open beta test and it spanned multiple days straight and it included a total of 10 exosuits to play. So this one was significantly different from the previous three. Whereas the second and third beta tests were barely any different than the first one. The only difference is that either in the second one or the third one, they added one extra playable character. But that by itself was not enough to merit making an entirely new video because all I would be talking about was my opinion on that suit. But I can just talk about it now when I get to the suits. Also, if you are still watching the video, if I haven't lost you yet, I just want to remind everyone that likes and comments and subscriptions and all of that are super appreciated because... I tried to get into the beta test early. There was an early phase in which you had to be accepted after submitting a request. And I wanted to get in extra early so that way I could start covering it earlier. But lo and behold, they did not accept me, which is no big deal. I think they were mostly approving people who were already part of the Capcom Creator Program, which I had applied to before. And I'm still trying to reapply to the Capcom Creator Program. I'm giving it a breather. I'm waiting until... Uh, Street Fighter 6 comes out. Once Street Fighter 6 comes out, I'm going to make some videos on that and then reapply to the Capcom Creator Program. So that way, when they look at my channel, they'll see a bunch of Street Fighter stuff and know that I'm legit about the Capcom stuff. So anyways, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that every metric counts because I'm pretty sure when they look at channels like this, the metrics matter a lot to them. They look at how many subscribers there are, what the average view count is and all of that. So anyways, thanks to everyone who already does subscribe and like my videos and comment and all that. Anyways, though, uh, just so that way I'm not repeating myself a ton. Firstly, I'm going to talk about my opinion on the new stuff that was in this beta test. And then once I get through that, I will return to talking about my opinion and impressions of the game overall and my predictions about what the game will eventually uh, turn into and how well it will sell, etc. So... Uh, as I said, this one was an open beta test, so with it being open, I was able to download it on everything, so I spent most of my time playing it on the PS4. On the first Exoprimal Impressions video that I made, the footage in the video was actually captured on my PC, and in it, I explain how even though I could run the game on high settings on my PC, whenever I would try recording footage, it would be really difficult so I had to run the game at very low settings in order in order to capture footage. So uh, this time I am going to be showing you PS4 footage, which should look significantly better than the PC footage at low settings. And surprisingly, with me playing it on a base PS4, the game actually ran really well. I was surprised to see how well it ran on base PS4 because this is a horde mode style of game with hundreds of enemies coming at you at once, hundreds of on-screen enemies, and it was designed for the PS5 and Xbox Series X, presumably, right? It's a next-gen horde mode game. So the fact that it can run well on a base PS4, very impressive. I didn't notice any kind of frame drops at all, so that's definitely a big positive with this game. The one graphical issue is that oftentimes there would be some very noticeable texture pop in, specifically on some of the exosuits and some of the larger dinosaurs. But I will gladly take texture pop in over frame drops any day of the week, so that's not really that big of a deal. Also, with this beta test, it had crossplay. I originally tried playing with the crossplay off because I did not want to be competing against people with mouse and keyboard aim. But the queue times were really long with crossplay turned off, at least on PS4. And eventually, with the queue times taking so long, they start a match, but they put you into a match with a lot of bots. So uh, I didn't have a bot. I didn't have bot matches every time on PS4 only, but most of the time there were some bots on both teams when you were playing with when I was playing with crossplay turned off. So I eventually just decided to keep crossplay turned on. I think. That's a necessary evil for this game because even though it kind of sucks having to compete 
against mouse and keyboard aim. I don't think this game is going to be super popular, so the fact that the game is going to launch with crossplay is very good. Plus, it's an option. Anyway, the other downside to playing this game on console is that you have to employ what is called a claw technique with your hands if you want to do a certain number of actions at the same time. Anybody who played Monster Hunter on the PSP will know exactly what I'm talking about. So, for example, let's say you want to be moving the character around with the left analog stick while also moving the camera with the right analog stick while also pressing a face button. You are going to have to do a claw technique. However, the game does allow you to remap any of the controls, which is great. That should be a standard in every video game ever, but for some reason it's not a standard, so whenever a game does it, I have to shout it out. So personally, I never bothered remapping any of the controls, but I imagine that you could try to make a control scheme in order to mitigate the amount of claw technique going on. With that said, you might want to try playing the game with a controller that has back buttons if you already own one. So in addition to this being an open beta test, the other main differences are that this time you can play as 10 different exosuits. It also includes new rigs to equip onto said exosuits, and it also includes a new game mode and map. So the new map, I actually really like the new map because before uh, you only had, if memory serves, you only had two maps. It was a city map during the day and the other one was a city map during the night. Whereas in this case, the new map is out in the jungle somewhere. I think it's Bikitoa Island. They gave a little bit of the lore insight, whatever the heck is going on with this game's lore. I think it's Bikitoa Island. Actually, they all, they might all be on Bikitoa Island, so that's not really important. But anyway, my point is that it looks like some kind of jungle, and so it gives off a bit more of a Jurassic Park vibe, which I really, really like. So I like the new map. The other new thing is in this beta test is that it actually had a new game mode in addition to the new map. I already mentioned the map, but it has a new game mode as well for the second half of a match. So the first half of these matches are always the PvE race mode in which you are trying to get to the second phase before the enemy team, right? Because in the first phase, it's you are playing in one instance of the game and the enemy team is playing in another instance of the game. But then in phase two, you are both playing in the same instance and you have to end up fighting each other. But what's weird is that it has a new game mode in place of another game mode that left. So in the previous beta tests, one of the potential game modes that you could get in phase two was this raid boss type of mode in which everybody is shooting this giant T-Rex in the same room together. For some reason, that one didn't show up at all here. I'm thinking maybe because they had to work on it a bit before they made it playable again, because it was a little janky. There were some janky things that happened in that mode, so maybe they were trying to work on that, which is why maybe they added this other game mode in the meantime. But the new game mode that was present here that wasn't present in the other beta tests is this hammer mode, I don't know if they have names, but you essentially have to pick up a hammer. So one of your teammates has to pick up this hammer. And while picking up the hammer, while carrying the hammer, it inhibits your movement abilities. So I never picked up the hammer with everyone. So I don't know if everyone would lose an ability from this. But for example, if you are playing Krieger and you pick up the hammer, you no longer have access to your dash, for example, right? So I'd imagine that's how it would work with everyone. But when you're holding the hammer, it charges up, and so you have to fight these waves of enemies while the hammer is charging up, and then once the hammer is fully charged, you have to hit this pillar sticking out of the ground, and then it will open up a wall, and then you can move to the next section. And finally, when you get to the third node that you have to hit, you have to hit that one before the enemy team, because that one is shared between both teams. So obviously you want to get there first. What's nice, though, is that Despite it inhibiting your movement, you actually get access to use the hammer as an ability, which does big damage to boss enemies, and it's also so fun to hit uh, play, player characters with it, too. Also, I noticed that it I think maybe it charges up the hammer. I'm pretty sure it charges up the hammer if you hit other players, because there was one time where I hit three other players at the same time, and it instantly charged my hammer, and then I was able to run and go win with that. 
It kind of creates a system, a dynamic though, in which you have to protect your player, which is carrying the hammer, because not only are they more vulnerable, not being able to have access to their movement ability anymore, but if they die, they drop the hammer, right? And that'll obviously slow down the progress and getting to the final pillar that you have to hit. So it kind of turns into a protect the president type game mode. So I did like the hammer mode, nothing too crazy, but I thought it was nice. Uh, but more importantly, you want to hear my opinion about the playable characters, right? The exosuits. So 10 new, well, not new exosuits. Five of them are new. Uh, I have the website open here. So I'll talk about the ones that were playable before. So Deadeye is the main uh, flagship mascot one. He's the orange one. I still think Deadeye is probably the best designed one overall because his kit just feels so complete. Also included in the new rigs was two melee rigs, one of which was a shuriken, which looked more like a fidget spinner than a shuriken. But the other one was this drill, this melee drill attack that has you putting a drill on your arm and you lunge forward and you use the drill, obviously, right? And at first I was thinking it felt kind of similar to something from Monster Hunter, such as using a gun lance or using a using the chainsaw mode on a switchblade, right? But then later it hit me. I realized this feels like the Helter Skelter from DMC5. I think they might have actually reused the animation for it. And so I like using Deadeye with the Helter Skelter because... After I realized that the drill rig felt like a devil breaker, specifically the Helter Skelter from DMC5, I realized that Deadeye's Palm Strike feels like another devil breaker from DMC5. I forgot the name of it, but I think it's the electric one, the one where Nero just pushes his hand forward and shocks an area in front of him. I think it's the exact same animation, actually. It might be. So I liked putting the drill rig on Deadeye because then you essentially get two Devil Breaker moves. And I think that's why I liked Deadeye so much in addition to his kit just feeling complete. So I like Deadeye. Zephyr, I actually did not play Zephyr, the blue guy, at all during this beta test because I played him a bunch in the other beta tests. But I'm pretty sure they did not change any kind of balance. I don't think they did any kind of balance adjustments or anything from the previous beta tests to now. So I didn't feel compelled to play Zephyr to see if anything was different because I'm just assuming nothing's different, right? But just to uh, just to make this a complete video talking about all the exosuits, uh, as I said before in the other video, I like Zephyr. I think he feels really nice. I like that he has Baji Quan moves that shoulder bash looks like Akira Yuki from Virtua Fighter. I think it's fun, but it gets kind of old after a while, just doing the same three moves over and over, right? It's kind of cool when you combine it with the movement rig because you get some cool movement tech with your attacks because a lot of your attacks move you around. And so the main thing you have to think about with Zephyr is which move do you want to use to start and engage and which move do you want to use to end your combo so to speak right but even then it's just like three moves you're doing over and over so even if it may feel like a dmc combo at first uh it's definitely not dmc right so i think zephyr gets old after a while which is kind of a microcosm of the entire game but i'll get onto that later uh, and then roadblock is the uh he was the only tank originally in the uh, first few beta tests i actually ended up liking roadblock a lot more this time uh, for a reason I will explain soon. But Roadblock, I think he's super solid. He has the Reinhardt shield. That's always useful. Uh, you can plug enemies in a lot of choke points if your if the choke point is narrow enough for your shield to take up all the width of it. And I, th I still think Roadblock has one of the, if not the best, ultimate in the game. He does a lariat and makes a giant tornado, and then you can suck up all the dinosaurs and then shoot the tornado out. It's pretty devastating, and in PvP, there's, re there's really nothing you can do about that. A Witch Doctor, I was saying in my other video that I think Witch Doctor is by far the strongest because the healing is absurd. The healing in this game is so extreme because in PvP, if you're able to keep healing your teammates, there's nothing you can do. You really just always have to focus the healer. So I think Witch Doctor, even with the new healing suits, I think Witch Doctor is the premier healer and I think he does it so much better than everyone else. Plus, you don't have to aim at all with your weapon, your damaging weapon, the Arc Lightning. So that's pretty good for PvP as well. And then uh, either the second or the third beta test, the one I was talking about that they added is called Barrage. Did I, did I mention the last one was called Witch Doctor? We have Deadeye, 
the orange one, Zephyr, the blue one, Roadblock, the tanky yellow one, a Witch Doctor, the green one, and Barrage is another yellow one, but unlike uh, Roadblock, Barrage is an assault class, and I did not like him very much at all, and that's why I didn't want to make a follow-up video just saying that I don't like Barrage, so... Barrage's archetype is that he's supposed to be some kind of grenade lobber. His main weapon is a grenade launcher. And I think they were going for a demon hunter archetype from Diablo in that you're able to do some kind of dodge roll. You're able to flip out of the way and you leave an explosion where you started. So you, they want you to be super evasive and all that, right? But it just felt as if his kit did not have any kind of synergy at all. I don't really understand what they were going for, right? Uh, like I said, maybe a, de a demon hunter type archetype, but his kit just doesn't have any kind of synergy at all, and I don't really have any fun playing him. I think his ultimate is cool, but you could have given that ultimate to anyone, and it would have made just as much sense. Uh, so I'm hoping Barrage gets a mini rework of sorts. Uh, but anyways, those are the five exosuits that were already playable in previous beta tests. So I specifically want to talk about the new ones, starting with Krieger, because Krieger was the one I was looking forward to the most. He's the big one, uh, and he has a minigun. And so looking at him, I had a feeling he would be the one I liked the most because he looked to be the archetype that I typically tend to gravitate towards. And it's really funny because I played Krieger first before anyone else in this beta test. And no joke, the last game I had streamed before this beta test was Gundam Evolution. And in Gundam Evolution, I had been playing Gundam Heavy Arms because Heavy Arms recently got added into the game. And Gundam Heavy Arms, his main weapon is a minigun that can overheat and he can also shoot missiles out, okay? Get this, Krieger, he has a minigun, which can overheat, and he can also shoot missiles out. So it literally felt as if I was playing the same game almost. Also, off stream, I've been playing Earth Defense Force 5, and the class I've been playing in Earth Defense Force is called Fencer. And Fencer, he's the heavy class in that game, and he has miniguns and can shoot missiles. So it's pretty funny that uh, I've been playing pretty much the same character in three different games over the past few months. But this is an important comparison, really, because I actually was a little underwhelmed with Krieger, despite him being the archetype that I typically enjoy quite a bit. Because even though I think Krieger is decently fun, he's functioning as intended, I think compared to Heavy Arms in Gundam Evo and Fencer from EDF, he's not as fun as either of those. I think one of the reasons is because, well, first of all, I think the missiles need to have better feedback. I think this game overall feels very, very good. That's the game's strongest element, the game's strongest facet by far, is that the game, as soon as you start playing the game, it leaves a very strong first impression because everything feels very good. So that's why it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, that Krieger's missiles don't really feel very satisfying because typically at any given moment, there's so much stuff happening on the screen that when you shoot the missiles out, you barely even notice it. And not only do you barely notice the missiles shooting out, but uh, when they explode into something, you barely see it and it doesn't really feel very impactful. And I think that might also be because enemies in this game, at least the regular enemies, don't have much HP at all. And so you never really get a chance to see enemies recoil from your attacks. So I think they need to make the missiles louder, maybe make more smoke, maybe make them uh, bigger looking, flashier, and maybe have a, uh, a bigger sound effect when they hit things. At first, I didn't really understand how they work because if you just tap the button, the missiles shoot out in front of you and it's so hard to hit anything in particular with it. But I found out later that if you hold it, it enters a lock-on mode. But what's weird is that the lock-on will only detect flying enemies or boss enemies or other players. It won't ever lock on to raptors, for example. So typically, if it were just a wave of raptors, I would just shoot the missiles in the middle of it because you can't really miss at that point. But I think the main thing is that they wanted you to save it for flying enemies. But what's weird is that when you hit things with the missiles, it doesn't really do much damage at all. It actually is more damaging to just use your minigun. I noticed that it stuns enemies, but the stun doesn't really matter at all 
because enemies die in this game so fast, right? And I don't think the stun ever worked on bosses. The stun would only work on small enemies. But like I said, small enemies die so fast anyway. So you were just using it for damage when it came to uh, the boss enemies, you know, like the big dinosaurs, like the Triceratops or the T-Rexes, etc. And so it just felt like, it just felt not satisfying at all. I think the missiles should be better. Maybe it was stunning actual enemy players. I never really was able to notice because, like I said, so much stuff is going on in this game. Uh, and his other ability is a dash, which is decent. It's okay. It works as intended. It's kind of fun to uh, CC the enemies as you dash through them. I don't think it does any damage. I think it only CCs them, but it's still fun in that sense. But again, I have the perspective of Fencer from Earth Defense Force. And I think Fencer and Earth Defense Force is so much more fun because, uh, trying to think how to explain this without making half the video talking about EDF. Basically, you can, you can set up the fencer's move set in such a way that you have dashes and jumps, okay? But there is an internal cooldown. So you're able to do, uh, let's say three dashes in a row before you have to wait on that internal cooldown, right? And the jumps are on a separate cooldown. So, you have to manage these invisible internal cooldowns just by getting a feel for it, but it feels very satisfying to do because you are able to jump out of a dash and you are able to dash out of a jump. And so it gives you all of this interesting movement tech that you can do. Not only that, but you can use certain weapon attacks to cancel the recovery at the end of a dash, for example. So for example, you can have a melee attack and you're able to dash, attack, dash, attack, dash, attack. And it feels very satisfying to move around the environment by doing this in a suit that would otherwise be very, very immobile, right? It feels as if you have an actual learning curve, an actual skill curve in actually learning how to pilot this thing, right? And I think it should feel that way if something's super heavy and mechanical looking. I think people wanting to play like big heavy, at least speaking for myself, I think one of the reasons why I like playing big heavy characters is that it feels as if you are actually learning how to control something that's otherwise kind of hard to control, right? So Krieger's okay. Uh, his best ability is the bubble. He has this bubble shield that he can place. It emanates outward from him. And it's similar to the roadblocks shield in that projectiles can't go through it. And... Enemies, I only found this out until later, which makes it really good for certain choke points, but enemies can't pass through it, right? But it's a little weird because I noticed that if you activate the bubble shield with an enemy close enough to you that the enemy would be inside of the bubble shield, it sometimes doesn't work. I know if you try to do the bubble shield with a big boss dinosaur, uh, ending up being halfway in the shield, it just instantly breaks the shield. So you have to be a little bit conscientious about how and when you use it. So I kind of like that, but I wish it were a bit more clear how it worked. And uh, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, issues I had could have been assuaged immediately if the game let you read what each ability does. So for example, in the game, if you are switching your suits, you can hover the cursor. So I'll talk about the UI later. I, I still think the UI in this game isn't very good. It's a little inefficient. A lot of times you have to do multiple steps to do something which could otherwise just take one step. So for example, when you're changing the suits, uh, actually the UI in general in this game, you have to move a cursor around. It's weird. It feels as if it's just a PC game ported to the console. So even though the game runs really well on console, and even though you can remap all of your controls, which is very nice, it still feels like they just kind of put it on the console without much thought because you have to move a cursor around and you have to cover the cursor over something and select it. And so it's just obtuse when you have to switch suits because you have to hit the touchpad on the controller, move the cursor over the suit that you want to switch to, and then when you move the cursor over to it, you have to hit X to select it, and then you have to hit triangle to confirm. And then you have to get out of your suit and then wait a while, wait for a cooldown, and then you have to hit triangle and O at the same time to summon the suit to get back in it. Uh, but like I said, you can remap controls, which is nice. Uh, so I don't know if it would always be, you know, triangle and X and triangle and O to do all of that. But still, regardless, if you remap things, it would still be the same amount of steps. So uh, talking about the UI still, I wish that when you hovered over a suit, you could maybe hit the options button or the start button, and it would give you an explanation of every ability on the suit. Because like I said, for example, I didn't know that the missiles could lock on. I wish I could have immediately just read that, right? 
because when you when you hover over them, it tells you a brief description of what the suit does in general, but you can't read what these specific abilities do. Maybe when the game actually comes out, it'll let you do that. Uh, but even so, I kind of wish I wish that were available in the beta test because a lot of this stuff is not very immediately intuitive, especially with how busy the screen is at any given time. And then Krieger's Ultimate. I think Krieger's Ultimate was I think Krieger's Ultimate is probably the most underwhelming thing about his kit which is why I eventually ended up appreciating Roadblock even more. I felt pretty average about Roadblock in the first few beta tests, but after playing Krieger, I ended up liking Roadblock more by proxy. But anyway, Krieger's ultimate, he essentially calls down what I think is an airstrike. I think it's an airstrike, but I don't really see anything firing from the sky. I don't, I don't see anything falling from the sky. You jump up in the air, you have a laser pointer, you select where you want the ult to happen and then it's just aoe damage of explosions like i said i think it's an airstrike but i don't see anything coming from the air so maybe it's just explosions from the ground uh but my point is that just like the missiles it's not very satisfying because with all the stuff going on at any moment all the movement all of the particle effects all of the noise I never, ever noticed my ult doing anything. It just added to the noise. It got drowned out very easily, right? So uh, just like the missiles, I hope that they make his ultimate more noticeable, louder maybe, maybe just a bit better, maybe make the area bigger, something like that. Because I think Krieger's a little underwhelming, especially compared to Heavy Arms from Gundam Evo and Fencer from EDF, which I think are good things to compare it to because they're so similar, right? So that was Krieger. The other, uh, another new character is Nimbus. Nimbus is uh, one of the supports. So all the supports can heal just like Witch Doctor. However, Nimbus has two different modes that she can switch between. She has a healing mode and a damage mode. In healing mode, her regular shots only heal. And in damage mode, her regular shots only damage. So if you want to do damage, you have to switch from healing mode to damage mode. I was a little confused about this character at first, though. And this is where I this is where I really wished you could read what each ability does, because if you switch to if you switch from melee mode to healing, or sorry, not melee mode, damage mode to healing mode, you would light up green on certain parts, right? That makes sense. And if you switched from healing mode to damage mode, you would glow orange on certain parts. OK, it's color coded. That makes sense, right? But after a while, after a few seconds, you stop glowing that color. And so I don't know if while it was glowing, it was somehow powered up or if it just goes away because it assumes that you're going to remember which mode you're in. But I can't imagine why they wouldn't just keep it lit up to let the player know which mode you're in, because why would you want to just stop communicating information to the player? I was thinking maybe in PvP, they wouldn't want to show the enemy which mode you're in, right? Maybe they would only want to show the enemy which mode you're in if they catch you switching to it or catching you like a few seconds after switching to it. But I was a little confused about that. Nimbus was okay, though. I kind of like how it has the uh, skating movement. It's funny. Nimbus's design looks different compared to all the other suits on this list. Nimbus looks as if it's from another game or something. Talking about the designs in general, in my first Exo Primal video, I was critiquing the game for having this weirdly overly detailed anthem esque design to the suits, while I wished for it to be more of like a tokusatsu design. So, this game is trying to be sort of funny every now and then, sort of satirical. It's kind of tonally inconsistent because whenever it does something to be funny, it always throws me off guard because. I was forgetting that the game was trying to be funny, and then it reminds me, oh yeah, this game is trying to be funny every now and then. It's, it, it's really weird, especially after playing something like Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush is one of the best examples of satire ever, uh, specifically talking about satire in games. Uh, I, I think of Portal 2 as well. Hi-Fi Rush was reminding me a lot of Portal and Borderlands. Portal 2 and Hi-Fi Rush are very good examples of workplace culture satire, right? Big business satire. I think it's very good. This game has a little bit of that, but it only does it every now and then. And I think if they really wanted to drive that home, they could look at something like Tiger and Bunny, the show Tiger and Bunny, where the superheroes have sponsors, right? Because the exosuits, the people you're playing in this game in Exo Primal, they're not military. I think they're like mercenaries or something. They just work for a company. They work for the Ibis Corporation, right? And so it would be so funny if they are wearing these 
more tokusatsu super sentai inspired designed suits and they have a bunch of stickers on them like advertising ibis or something i think that would be funny i think that would have made it more tonally consistent with what they're trying to go for but even so i think a lot of these designs grew on me so i do like nimbus's design even though she looks way different from the other ones uh, the other design I really like is Skywave. I think out of the out of all of the designs, I like Skywave the most. Skywave is the other support. This one specifically can fly. She feels similar to the Artificer from Risk of Rain, if you are familiar with that game. But I, I really like Skywave's design because uh, of the shape language. I think she has a really strong silhouette. I like how the the hat, the helmet, is reminiscent of like a witch hat or something like that. But also, I really like how she has these wings coming from her hips, akin to Morgan from Darkstalkers. I was not expecting to see a Darkstalkers character design element anywhere in this game, but I thought it was cool to see a Darkstalkers character design element translated into a mechanical suit, because Darkstalkers is the only thing I can think of in which they have wings coming from characters hips but skywave like i said uh is like artificer from risk of rain because she can fly and she has an ability that lets her go up in the air so that way she can stay airborne for longer i think skywave is cool i think she's fun and effective during the pve parts of the game but during the pvp parts of the game i think she's really bad because Whenever you are in the air, everyone just shoots at you and there's nothing you can do about it, right? You cannot stay in the air, especially with there being a sniper exosuit that I will get to. The sniper just destroys Skywave, so I don't think Skywave is viable in PvP at all. Uh, so I'll talk about the sniper then, since I was alluding to it. The sniper, Vigilant. Sniper is the one I played the least naturally because I was playing on PlayStation and I didn't want to try sniping with a controller. But... I think the sniper is the strongest, at least if you're playing on PC, because when you get to the PvP sections of the game modes, when you get to the second half of a match and it turns into PvP, there's really nothing you can do about the sniper. The sniper can freeze you, the sniper can shoot you from across the map, and... With all the stuff going on, you never really know if you are in the sights of a sniper or not because you have no idea where they are. Maybe if the game's out for a while, people are going to learn where the sniper's like camping. But even, snow, but even so, snipers can shoot you from so far away and they do so much damage. I really think that the comps in PvP are going to be like Witch Doctor and two snipers and Murasame, which I will get to. Actually, I'll get to it now since I just uh, segued into it. Uh, actually, will that be the last one? Yeah, I talked about Krieger, Nimbus, Deadeye, Zephyr, Witch Doctor, Roadblock, Barrage, uh, Vigilant. Vigilant is the sniper. Uh, Skywave is the other healer. Yeah, so Murasame is the last one. I think Murasame is very good. Murasame is the third tank class, which you might not expect by looking at him because he is the samurai suit. And you might wonder, how is a samurai a tank, right? It's because he has this guard stance he has a, a parry stance where he will literally block any kind of any incoming damage which makes him insanely good and if you do block or parry something in this stance you can then hit a button to do this giant counter attack which is really strong he's really strong in pve and pvp i think he's very good in pve in the pve race section because he has this grappling hook move especially if you combine him with the uh, movement rig he can move across the map so fast, which is crazy for a tank, right? And so I'm pretty sure in the PvE section of these matches, the next wave procs as soon as at least one person gets to the next area. And so if you have a Murasame on the team, run ahead and start the next wave ahead of time, you're able to get through the PvE section so fast. So I think everyone is going to want to have one Murasame. But like I said, he's good in both PvE and PvP. Because for one, you can literally block anything with the guard stance. There's no counterplay to that at all. And not only that, but his regular attack with his sword, it feels similar to the long sword in Monster Hunter. But it's just so easy to hit enemies with the sword. It has a really big hitbox. And so if you're able to run a player down in PvP, you're able to just keep mashing your melee button. And there's really nothing they can do about it. And that's why I think Murasame is super good. So if I were to make some kind of tier list right now, 
Murasame, Vigilant, and Witch Doctor are the top three. I think the PvP comps, like I said, it'll be a Witch Doctor, two Vigilants, and a Murasame. Maybe two Murasame, one Sniper, something like that. I don't think Sniper really is that great on PvE, though. So I think during PvE, you should have one Witch Doctor, three Murasame. I'm not even kidding. Although you might have an issue hitting the airborne enemies in that case, so maybe you'd want to have uh, one of the Murasames swapped out for someone that can shoot the enemies in the sky. So anyways, those are the 10 exosuits that took a long time to talk about, but that is the main difference between this beta test and the previous ones, and I'm sure that's what most people want to hear about. So that is my... Uh, opinion on the exosuits like i said the designs are growing on me i really like skywave's design i think some of them are a lot better and more complete than others so dead eye feels like a very complete kit whereas barrage feels like he needs to be reworked because his kit doesn't really have any synergy at all and krieger for example i think krieger's abilities need to feel a bit more satisfying especially compared to uh, Roadblocks Ultimate, which is a giant tornado lariat, right? Whereas with Krieger's Ultimate, you don't even notice it happening. So now that I have finished speaking about the new things to be found in this beta test, I will return to speaking about my impressions of the game in general, including this beta test and the previous beta tests. So firstly, I think it is a mistake that this game is being pushed as a live service game. I don't think that's going to work out very well for it. I think it would make for a great multiplayer game. Maybe a game you would play on the weekend with your friends if you all have a day off at the same time, or if you're able to get a group of viewers together on Twitch and you can play it with your Twitch chat on a weekend. Maybe play it once a week or once every two weeks, something like that. I just do not think that the game could keep your attention for long enough to be played for weeks straight indefinitely by Twitch streamers. I don't think it's going to really have much of a Twitch scene that Capcom is wanting it to have. Because even though you have these different game modes, which definitely add variety, the issue is that no one game mode in particular is really deep enough to keep you interested for a long period of time, which would be required for a live service game, right? I don't think that's a big deal because not every game has to be a live service game, right? So they should stop marketing it as such. Or if they really wanted it to be a live service game, you would expect them to make it free to play, right? Instead of a full $60, which is why I think it's actually great that they announced this game for Game Pass because that is going to allow way more people to play it that otherwise would have. Because personally, I was not planning on buying this at launch at all, but I will definitely play it on Game Pass since I have Game Pass. Anyway... And speaking about other horde games, horde mode style games, I think the main issue with this game compared to other horde mode games that I would rather play, such as Warhammer Vermintide, Left 4 Dead is obviously a popular one. I think Left 4 Dead really is the one that originated this genre, right? So think of something like Left 4 Dead or Vermintide. The reason why Left 4 Dead and Vermintide are so much better than this game is is really just purely due to the enemy variety. While Exoprimal does have multiple different enemies, it doesn't matter at all, because whenever a new enemy spawns in in Exoprimal, not one enemy type forces you to play the game differently. All you're doing the entire time in Exoprimal against the AI enemies is you're just gunning them down the whole time. Or if you're playing a melee suit, you're just mashing melee on them the whole time, right? So it's really easy to start autopiloting. I noticed I started to mentally check out pretty early after playing it for three days straight, right? So I can imagine if I owned the game, I probably wouldn't play it for much longer than three days straight because you mentally check out so quickly. Whereas in a game like Vermintide or Left 4 Dead, it always forces you to keep thinking because, for example, in Vermintide, there are enemies that actually force you to play the game differently. So uh, one example is an enemy that can throw gas grenades, right? So if you hear the sound cue of an enemy throwing a gas grenade, you will communicate to your teammates, okay, we need to spread out, right? Because if we clump up and one of us gets caught in the grenade, we're all going to suffer the same fate. So we need to be spread out. Whereas if you hear an enemy, one of the one of the rat enemies in Vermintide, he has this, I don't even know what you call it, but it's what animal control people use, ironically. It's this metal rod with a claw on the end. So this rat will sneak up and put it around your neck and drag you off, right? Obviously based on archetypes from Left 4 Dead, but I'm more familiar with Vermintide, which is why I'm mentioning Vermintide examples. So when you hear that enemy, the trapper, the rat, 
uh, with the claw, you have to tell your teammates, okay, we hear a trapper. He's somewhere in there. He's somewhere mixed in with all the enemies. So for this enemy, we have to stay close together because if one of us gets grabbed, the other teammates can immediately shoot the rat, right? And save the teammate. So that would be a different strategy compared to when you hear the grenade enemy, right? And there are all sorts of enemy types in that game which force you to change up your strategy on the fly. And of course, if you have different types of enemy compositions, that just adds layers onto the mental stack. Whereas it does not matter, like I said, it does not matter what kind of enemy they throw at you in Exoprimal because the entire time you're just mowing them down. And they're so easy. I know it doesn't really matter that much that the dinosaurs pose very little threat in the PvE section in Exoprimal because I understand that the challenge isn't fighting the dinosaurs but but beating them faster than the opponent team, so that's why they're so easy. But even so, I think they could be more challenging because it would just be more satisfying to fight. Earlier, I was talking about how the fencer in Earth Defense Force is so much more fun than Krieger in this game. And I think one of the reasons why, in addition to what I said earlier, is that when you are using the minigun, when you are a fencer and you're using the minigun on these giant ants or these giant frogs or these giant spiders or whatever, the enemies in that game are dangerous so you feel as if you're actually having to stand in front of something dangerous. And the enemies in that game have enough HP that they're not just going to instantly die. And so in that game, they actually recoil from the hits. And for example, with the frogs, you're able to shoot their limbs off, and then they fall down, and then they try shooting at you while they're on the ground. And it's just so much more interactive. It keeps, it keeps you way more mentally engaged. And I never thought I would say the Earth Defense Force was a mentally engaging game. I always thought Earth Defense Force was a brain dead game until I played Exo Primal because Exo Primal is definitely, uh, a lot less engaging, at least after a while. Even with Exo Primal being a triple A game from one of the biggest triple A developers in the world, whereas, Earth Defense Force is some random double-A company that I think only makes Earth Defense Force. But anyways, I hope I made my point clear. I hope you guys see why a game like Vermintide would have much more longevity and would have much more of a fan base than something like Exoprimal. It still feels as if I just don't know what it's going for. I don't know who it's for, right? It has kind of a little bit of everything, but that turns it into a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. In a way, I actually do think... It is weirdly respectable that instead of Capcom going for what would automatically print money in a Dino Crisis remake, they are going for something that nobody asked for. That sounds like a weird insult, but it really isn't. I actually do find it weirdly respectable that a company that big wouldn't just automatically go for whatever would print money. Even though I do hope that eventually we get a Dino Crisis remake later on, right? So anyways... Thanks for watching, everyone. Let me know what you think about the game. If you played the beta test, let me know your thoughts. Or if you didn't play the open beta test, let me know why not. Because it was an open beta test, so literally anyone could play it. I was hoping that at least some of my mutual streamers would have played the game because I wanted to invite someone else on here. I wanted to invite, I wanted to just get someone, anyone, to get on this video with me so I could talk about it with them to make this video differentiated from my first Exo Primal video, but literally none of my mutuals were playing this game. It was literally just me. So anyways, let me know in the comments, and I will see all of you guys later. So bye for now.